recording. Okay, so I like to start out by just kind of telling you what we're going to talk about today, kind of give you some perspective and then go deep, deeper into that. So one of the things I find when you're doing genealogy, there's three things I stress to everybody I talk to. Understand what your family knows or what you don't know and work with that. Understand the historical context by which your family did whatever it was they did and try to connect yourself to what their past was like. So one of the things I want to talk about is the most difficult thing in doing Irish research is finding out where your ancestors came from. Most people, you know, if you could go down to the lowest possible level, which is the town one, that's great. Or the parish, whether it's a religious or classically ecclesiastical parish, or the civil parish. Most people just know the county. Most people don't even know anything more than they came from Ireland. So understanding that context is, is a difficult challenge to go over. And for many genealogists and family historians, that can be a real challenge. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes today. We'll walk through a case study of how you could possibly solve that problem for yourself. Good genealogical techniques, though, are critically important to everything that we do. And that can help you also determine where your ancestors' place of origin is. So the topic I'm covering today is relatives who came from County County to Nebraska. And you have to look at the rationale why people came to the United States or very North America. A lot of them left during periods of political or religious strife. Uh, there was economic issues. Uh, there were um, great famine, of course, brought a lot of people to the United States as well. And a lot of that action occurred in the mid 1800s. So if that's your focus. We're talking about the same kind of information. If it's pre 1800, there's a whole other set of rationale in which your ancestors may have come through the maritime provinces of Canada or Pennsylvania, as Scots Irish did down the Great Wagon Trail, or other reasons, or post family, people came for economic opportunities that were available in the United States. And even with, regardless of when your family came here, there are often things that they pass down through your family that you know it's in terms of family histories, family traditions, and they continue to pass that down from generation to generation. Those stories we find them may not always be accurate. There may be some fiction behind it, but there's also a little bit of truth. And that's one of the things we'll talk about. But no matter what the circumstances are, when we do good historical research and our family theology, we try to bring the stories of our ancestors back to life, and we do that through good genealogical techniques. But one of the things that we often want to do, and a place I like to start if you don't know where you want to go, is what's your surname, or what's your family surname. Now, disregarding the fact that there was no standardization in how surnames are spelled, at least you have an idea of what it could possibly be. And a lot of times, if you have that kind of information, that's, a, that's the starting point I tell people to look at. And a technique we use <clears throat> doing this kind of stuff is called the heat map visualization. And I'll show you an example. But what that means is it takes a high level view of where your ancestral surname may have been and gives you at least that for a starting point. And you can associate that with your family tree. John Grenham, and I'll show you his website in a second, has a uses Griffith's valuation to see where that surname is most prevalent using Griffith's valuation, which is from 1847 to 1854, as a means of determining where the ancestors' surname came from. This is a screenshot of Brennan's website. And when using it, you can enter in your surname right here. Brennan's got a bunch of other stuff. You can't probably read it. Surnames, place names, browse, and some other information. And ancestral information. There's a blog up here. JohnGrenham.com, great place to go. Generally, it runs about $99 a year. However, if you belong to certain genealogical societies like New England Genealogical Society, we get it for half price. So, and some, but not all libraries, I'm found in this area, provide on library access. So, uh, something to consider. So, I'm going to give you an example of a surname, Macaulay. And we're going to use Macaulay throughout the presentation. So entering in surname Macaulay, what Brennan does is using that 1847-64 period of time, you can't very well see this, but if I look here at Donegal, there are 69 Macaulay's listed there in that time period. 
There's uh, life from 12. The other thing, excuse me, as I said, everyone didn't spell their name quite right. So what Brennan does is you see name variations. So for example, Polly over here, he's got 254 with a little bit of different spelling than what I've listed here. And you see all the different variations that he's got from this out there. What that does though, is that heat map visualization tells you where in Ireland Polly's show up. So if your family history says, hey, there's a county court, you know, it might be down in here, that one on the dock. I'm going to show you how to use that part of this case study. But don't, <clears throat> when you start doing Irish research, I often say, look at every possible source. And I'm going to look at some things that are over there right now that you look. For example, headstones and gravestones. You do surname searches based on where your ancestors find the buried. Discover Ever After is a Northern Ireland site. Um, Interment.net uh, covers all of Ireland. I'll show you there's screenshot in a second. Even down at the individual cemetery level, you know, like here in Dublin Cemetery Trust, last in the trust.ie, you have listings of the Dublin cemeteries by name. You can search surnames there. In the United States, we do that through find a grave with millions of graves.com. And something that's recently happened over the course of last year is find a grave to start adding Irish cemeteries. So we've got that to work with your surname. Great place to go. This is internet.net for Ireland. See here within the Republic in the south of Ireland, we have Carlo, Cabin, Clare, all these counties are available. Monaghan and Waterford do not have any listings just yet. Northern Ireland, Eight Antro, and uh, Armagh, down in Fairmont are all listed there. So you can enter in your survey and your first name or search burial record, and you can find possible grave sites and your ancestors over there. The other thing we like to do <clears throat> when we talk about looking for our ancestors is using censuses and census substitutes. Well, the issue we have in Ireland is census records were not always well done. Uh, prior to 1821, they were just done for statistical purposes, it really wasn't a naming convention associated with that. 1821, 1850, 1821 to 1851, the censuses were destroyed in the Irish Civil War and the Foreign Fire in 1922. 1861, 1891, and in 1926, the Irish government said, hey, you don't need all these census records. They pulped them. Um, part of the reason for the pulping was not just because they wanted to save space, but because there were uh, ideas that there were some privacy issues associated with the information on the census. So they got rid of it. Some partial fragments and segments of those censuses do exist. So we're always looking when we do Irish research for census substitutes. And the three that I've listed here are uh, Griffith's Valuation. I'll talk a little more in depth about that. The Valuation Revision Books. And even school records are available to the you know, Ireland's uh, Public Records Office of Northern Ireland, Crony, if you had uh, ancestors that were part of the Irish school system. Now, the one thing that you find when you're looking at Griffin's valuation is Griffin's valuation was originally designed as a tax assessment. They wanted to know, based on who the property owners were, how much land was owned, what was the value of the land, how many houses, how many outbuildings they had, you know, the list here. Uh, offices, offices were not offices, there were granaries or barns or things like that. And what it did is that in order to sustain the Church of Ireland, which was the principal church, the matter to religious persuasion was, the Church of Ireland was the state church, and therefore the taxpayers or the land owners um, had to pay their share of the tithe to support the church, the pastor, the vicars, and the rectors. So here's a couple of examples that just to show you, and there's a whole discussion I can do on Griffith's valuation if you don't find for today. This is Walt Disney's dad, Keppel Elias Disney. He was a renter. So he knows where he was. He was renting property from James Dunphy. He had land. And these numbers over here indicate how big the land was, 
what the crop value associated with that land would be and how much the population be taxed for that land ownership. Patrick Kennedy was the great grandfather of John Kennedy. And the other thing about Griffith's valuation, it gives you the townland name, the parish name, and the county name. So if you're lucky enough to have an ancestor who owned property in Ireland, you can zero right in on where they were. And there's home over here. These are mapping configurations, the ordinance map, so you can actually see in 1847 where the land was, and you can do similar searches using Google Maps to find out what the property looks like today. So Patrick Kennedy is uh, he lived in Dunningstown, White Church Parish in County Wexford. And again, he owned uh, he rented the land from this guy, George Adams Glasscott. And apparently Mr. Glasscott had a whole bunch of property that he was renting out. So we use Griffith's valuation as a means to substitute for those tenants. But there are other things you can look at when you're trying to do Irish research. Um, quickly, she just an example of other ones. The Tide of Plotman book started by 1823, and the English government and associated with the Irish government implied that a tithe would be paid to support the Church of Ireland. And so they had what's called a composition act that occurred in 1823 that the established church would make sure money was paid. And the people that pay would be those people who own land. So if your ancestor owned less than an acre, they were a tenant farmer, they were a laborer, they lived in town, or they were renting lands from the Church of Ireland, they won't show up on the title plot of rights. I mentioned the, uh, the top valuation books and the uh, changes. What that, those books did is every time somebody died, moved, whatever, they changed those books. And then literally, you can read them today if you find them, where they would line through or strike through the information on it, right into the next person in line. And that was the means that the tax office could update their files <laughs> continuous. So that's more information available from those textbooks or all the quadro books. Hearth money rolls. Uh, if you had a hearth and you owned a house, and a hearth was anything that kept the fire in the fireplace, that was taxed. So a lot of Irish homes, cottages didn't have anything in front. It was bare floor into the fireplace. So they wouldn't have a tax. Black sort of spinning wheel list. I'll show you that in a second. That was an interesting thing because in the 1700s, uh, throughout the 1700s, Irish linen was the thing to do. They raised flax um, they, because they wanted to raise so much flax, and there was a high demand in England for Irish linen that they gave spinning wheels away. And the more land you had in flax, the more spinning wheels you got. So they kept track of that. Freeholder lists were a list. And people who own property and who were also in the polls so they could vote. So in the period 1700s, 1800s, if you, uh, your ancestors had property and they could vote, they might be listed three old days. Religious census is for a big thing. Um, the primary religion in Ireland at this time was the Church of Ireland, which was a state church. Although the Roman Catholic Church was there, the Baptists were there, the Presbyterians, the Quakers, the Church of Ireland kept track of everybody. Didn't matter what your religious denomination is. Now, uh, if you were born in Ireland and you were Roman Catholic, you still had to register the birth of that child in the Church of Ireland records. And I'll show you examples of where the Irish Catholic records were available and start to take advantage of those. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the estate records. There were large land in the state, especially in the areas of Connacht in Ireland in which these large estates have been subdivided from the early Irish kings down to larger properties, and people who rented on those properties were listed in these estate records. That would include things like um, uh, rent contracts. So your ancestor may have rented land on the land of the estates, and you listed in those cases. Uh, there's also deeds records, this, uh, a transmission of uh, ancestral records from through the uh, schedule of wills are also tied to the state records. There's one other one up here I didn't list. Uh, I did mention it, the tithe defaulters. If you own land and you were given a tithe to pay to the Church of Ireland, 
think that pastor or that rector or vicar, and you didn't, they kept track of who you were. And so there's a list of those people as well. So they kept track of it. So here's the example of the Irish flax grower site. I've listened to the link right here, I think it's the syllabus. But there are about 60,000 people in 1796 that were paid and tracked for the number of acres of flax that were planted to be spinning wheels. So if you plant one acre of flax, you got four spinning wheels. And that's a lot of flax. If you have looked at agricultural context, flax is growing, cut, soaked in water, the fibers inside the stock then become the threads that were spun by the spinning wheels in the in Irish land. So that created a lot of flax. But you got four spinning wheels for your efforts. Church records are important. And as I said, in Ireland, the religious traditions may provide you insight for your ancestors here on what they did there. The answers are are that if your ancestor was Roman Catholic in Ireland, it's probably Roman Catholic here in the United States, which gives you some hints as to where you can start to check things out. The National Library of Ireland has digitized a significant number of Irish church records. Now, understanding history and understanding ecclesiastical practices, Irish Catholics wanted to have their children baptized as soon after birth as possible. Of course, marriages were reported in the Irish church. You'll never find or very seldom find burial records associated with the Roman Catholic Church because it's not a sacramental process. But you may find those in the Church of Ireland records because they kept track of everybody that was buried. If you were a Irish Catholic, your death would be recorded in the Church of Ireland records because they want to make sure you were properly buried in a valid cemetery. So that's why I say if you had Irish Catholic ancestors, Check the Church of Ireland. There's records there that may influence your search. Now, a number of sites provide uh, access to it. The John Brennan site, which I showed you, rootsireland.ie is a wonderful site for looking at church records, and irishgenealogy.ie. And because the Catholic Church has had so much success over the course of the last 15 years, the Anglican Church, or the Church of Ireland, has started to digitize their parish records. And it's an ongoing process. A lot of the stuff is not indexed, but they do have available PDF files you can search if you know the civil parish and associated religious parish from which your Anglican um, ancestors came from. The Presbyterian Historical Society in Ireland does have some records. So you can look at that site to see what's available. But most of that is already in book form, not digital form. And of course, I always encourage people to take a look at the local or church our high archdiocese records here in the United States. Because as I said, if your ancestor was a particular religious denomination in Ireland, chances are they can give that up, they brought it back here. So if you're doing Scots-Irish research, you wanna check this, the Presbyterian churches in the area in which your ancestor came to settle in the United States before they moved on. Same with Roman Catholic and so on. And the reason I say all that is because very often, if you start looking at baptismal records and marriage records for our ancestors here in the United States, there will be references in those documents to where they came from and where the families were in Ireland. IrishGenealogy.ie, if you haven't gone to this site, you need to do so. Uh, this snapshot is of the church records. So these are all church records, uh, both, uh, all denominations. Uh, for what they have. The key about irishgenealogy.ie is that this website is maintained and managed by the Irish Bureau of Tourism. There are so many people going to Ireland that the Irish government has said, we're going to give them information to look up. So when they come over to Ireland, we've already given them a head start. So you have church records, you have civil records, you have other research and links that are Some of those links change almost every day. And the reason I say that is because at the county level, a lot of the, the local archives are digitizing their records. Recently, I just looked at the at Wex records, and they've digitized a whole bunch of their local records, civil records, so you can access those from home. So I constantly I look at this 
almost every other day because it's such a valuable resource. Um, in addition to this, there are a lot of registers that have um, information that may be associated with, in this case, church records. You may find in marriage who were the um, sponsors, best man, you know, those type of people are listed in addition to the bride and groom. Same thing for baptismal records, which is associated with that, especially in the Catholic uh, religion. You have witnesses to the baptism whose names are also listed there, which may give you some piece of connectivity to who your ancestor was, or maybe associated families or relatives that were in the area. When all else fails, take a hard look at the government office record. Now, the general record office records in Ireland. Um, the public records office of Northern Ireland, Crony, general records office of Northern Ireland, Crony, and the Irish archives have many birth and death and marriage records that you might be able to find. A lot of transcripts, especially those of births in this time period, are available at familysearch.org. So you can look at that. Um, transcripts of local registrar offices are available on RoothIreland.ie, and like I said, IrishGenealogy.ie as well. Again, don't have to look at just the subscription sites to go find your information. I mentioned the Tide of Plotman books, those are available for you to look at in the National Archives of Ireland. Griffith's valuations are available in a number of different locations. One I look at is Ask About Ireland, i.e., Griffith. I mentioned Crony, Land of State Records, and the Registry of Deeds are just now for the Republic of Ireland being digitized. Uh, up until this point in time, they're readily available to go over and go to look at. Um, it's been an ongoing effort. I was just in a class with uh, David Rencher, uh, who said that he sees this happening, but it's going to be probably a 10 to 15 year process to digitize the register of these information. But if you can get into it, or if you can find the written or the uh, printed narrative, Registry of Deeds is just like in the United States. You go to Registry of Deeds office. We tell you who owns the land, who it was sold to, if there are wills associated with that, if there are lines of inheritance. That information is available. So look at all these perspectives when you start looking at what you've got and from, uh, what your ancestors may or may not have owned. Move back over here, this side of the United States. Take a hard look at the naturalization records that you have. Now, in the 1900 census, there is a place where it says you can find out if papers are filed, there's a code, naturalization, no report, or if a person is an alien. That's the only census that provides that kind of information. However, the key thing to remember is that naturalization requests only happened before 1911 at the local level. So if you have an ancestor, I'll give an example for myself. I have Irish ancestors in Almaty County, Iowa, which is the far northeast part of the state of Iowa. I was able to go to the county archives, find their declaration of intent and the naturalization records. And the declaration of intent said, hey, I came from this townland, county court on this day, and I was uh, given up my allegiance to the king or queen of England, whoever it was at that time. So pay attention to what your, where your ancestors lived here in the United States, because at the local courthouse, if they were naturalized as American citizens, you'll find paperwork that indicates where they were in Ireland. Also, don't give up on looking at newspapers. I'm going to talk with the court perspective from Ireland first. There are a number of different websites that are out there that are available. Irish News Archive is primarily 20th century. So if you had someone come over after 1900, you can look there. But if you look at irishtimes.com, they date newspapers back to 1850. And find my past as 1922 and prior uh, collections of newspapers that are available. And also, of course, rely on newspapers.com, genealogy bank, on newspaperarchive.com, and even chronically America for stateside information. Also, pay attention to the ethnic newspapers. There are a number of ethnic newspapers printed, especially in Boston and New York. You can find some of those listed on Find My Past and genealogybank.com. In the context of those newspapers, and especially in the 
There were only 1,800 students by 1870. There were one ads posted, in the, especially in the Boston newspaper, um, which was also working done with the uh, Archdiocese of Boston's uh, cooperation. But people would request, <clears throat> I came to the United States on such and such a day. I'm looking for my brother Patrick, who's been here for five years. So you can find those type of advertisements in those early newspapers, especially in Boston and New York. The New England Historical Society also has links to those types of newspapers, especially the Boston uh, papers, which have both the Boston Catholic newspaper with information as well as the local newspaper. And of course, check out your state and local archives for the papers here. This is uh, a screenshot of the Irish newspaper archive. Um, in this particular case, uh, I did look at it last night when I put this on here. They've now got some newspapers going back to 1733. So, not to say your ancestors got into the newspapers, but if they were, you might find it. Uh, that site currently has over one and a half million pages of newspaper content, uh, two million in the works for the papers such as the Freedmen's Journal, the Irish Independent, and the Anglo Health. It's kind of pricey, $149 a year. And you can buy it on a monthly basis too for twenty dollars a month. So if you only do is short-term research, you might be able to use that. <clears throat> and of course, passenger lists, ships manifest. We all know about that. How our ancestors came over. You can use ancestry family search. Um, I encourage people who have got ancestors come from Ellis Island. You can go to the org website. And castlegarden.org, if your ancestors came in before Ellis Island became a popular place to come. And occasionally the maiden names of women will be listed on those records. So, researching vital records, probably the last thing I want to cover is talk about, especially after 1900, and we're talking stateside. The key takeaway from this is understand. Who's the informant for the information? If you're look at, looking at information associated with birth, the person who was born didn't give them the information when that birth did. The person that died isn't giving the information about who the next of kin was that was providing the information, which includes the place or location of birth. So be careful to understand how the information is being compiled. But as you're looking at that stuff, sometimes there's information in those records of the town or county of origin, which could help you in your ancestral research. So that's a lot of stuff. Now I want to show you an example of how I took that kind of genealogical uh, methodology and put it to work for myself. So I started looking, as I say here, for the required documentation for my wife to apply to become a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. She had a has a third cousin who was an Arizona State Regent for DAR. So that lady, clearly a member of the DAR, and she'd already done the work. From this guy, my wife's two times great grandfather, backwards to Francis Carvin, who fought with Washington at Valley Forge. He was a drummer and a bugler way back in the day. So the line of descendancy from him to my wife's mother and to my wife follows this path. But I'm stymied because I've got to figure out how to fill out the paperwork from my wife's great grandmother through my wife. Because I already got the other stuff. That's that's done based on what that region is like. So my challenge is going back and taking a look at it and start looking at my wife's great grandmother's birth in October 1873 in Farley, Butte County, Iowa. How does this factor in been in Ireland? So I find that the great great grandmother, who was born in Farley, died in Manhattan, Kansas. 1858. And I followed her mother back and then up to her parents. So great grandmother, two more generations of kids. 
And I find that my wife's third great grandmother was born in Rome, New York, 1849. And I actually found in her paperwork, an obituary for her mother, who, who published in the Creighton, Nebraska News in March of 1921. So I didn't need this stuff going back this way, but it intrigued me because I'm researching Irish ancestors. I said, okay, let me figure this out. And so the obituary said that her husband, James, uh, she married him in 1848 in County Cabin in the United States. Okay, so now I'm, I really want to find out. So, and I'll try to read through this. It's hard to read. So I found this obituary in the Creighton, Nebraska News, 10 March 1921. And if you haven't looked at advantage-preservation.com, small city county libraries are digitizing their own newspapers. No, they're not on newspapers.com for the most part. They're not in Chronicle in America, but these small libraries are digitized. So in uh, Creighton, um, Nebraska, AdvantagePreservation.com digitized their newspaper. So what I found right here it says Martin Coyle was born in Town Cabin, 17 March 1828. That's something worth it. She married James McCauley County Cabin in 20 years after. They moved to Rome, New York. Okay, now I'm on track for that daughter that was coming to Rome. <clears throat> Trying from the obituary that in 1882, they moved to Knox County, Nebraska, who was farming south of Creighton. They owned the Brown Hotel in Creighton until 1901. Jim died in 1901. Margaret had 11 kids, one of which was Margaret Paul Hoover, my wife's second great grandmother. And then Margaret died in March of 1921. So all that from a local newspaper. So now I've got something else to work with. So what I did is I took you know, get your information that was good and start making some extrapolations. Um, she married James, 1848, County Cabin. So I'm going to look for some uh, marriage records there. Her funeral was held at St. Mary Catholic Church in O'Neill, Nebraska. So I made the assumption that they were married in a Catholic church in County Cabin, as it probably didn't give up the religious persuasion. I used johngrenums.com heat map assessment to do a correlation a Brenham site not only lets you search for one name, but it allows you to pair it with a second name. So now I've got a heat map, as I showed you earlier, to go back and see where those two names show up and how often they do. I use RootsIreland.e, subscription yeah. site, for the marriage records for Martin Coyle and the Hudson's surname of the column. I found an index indicating they were married on 4 May 1848 in the parish of Anak. So now I've zeroed down to the parish <coughs> I went to the National Library of Ireland. I found the digitized records for the Catholic parish records. I found the marriage records. And then I followed the same procedure, but I was unable to find their baptismal records. So I've got to look for that. So I can get to that. Eventually, I can figure out who their parents are. So let me show you how this process works. So I mentioned Brennan's site. And that search page, you can enter in surnames. So I said, where's Macaulay, where are Coyle in the same parish? And so it comes up with this. It gives me a highlight. Remember that she said her obituary was uh, born in County Cabin, married in County Cabin, right here. So I was able to look at that. <laughs> Then using rootsireland.ie, the subscription site, I was able to go in, enter marriage records for Ireland, his last name Coil, her, name, or her last name Coil, named Margaret, approximate year 1848, and spouse surname Holly. I wanted to search all the counties of Ireland just to make sure I didn't leave something out. So it gives me something. And that is it. I found him. In parish of Anna, marriage date 4 May 1848, James McCauley, again, spelling issues, but it's still the same, Margaret Coyle, and both of them were Roman Catholic. Now I've got something else to work with. So remember, I said 
the National Library of Ireland is digitizing the Catholic parish record. These, this book, and they are not indexed, so you have to go page by page, but at least I had a marriage date to zero in on. And this is the parish record for Anna for January 1848 to May 1848. And while it's not a clear picture here, here's where I found it. Let me blow that up. So this is the page in that Catholic parish records. And the other thing is you start to go through your Catholic records is you have to understand that you got a couple issues there. Number one, it's either Latinized, so you gotta look at the Latin. Penmanship is not great, and there may be some English spelling there. So in the case here, I translated from uh, Latin, joint marriage, merit, faith, and folly, as known as folly spelling, Mark Coyle, and the witnesses, Patrick Lewis and Mary Smith. There's my citation for it. So I'm able to go right into parish records to find their marriage stuff. Okay, I'm not ready to start. Leave that. So now I'm thinking of historical context. Well, she said they were left Ireland the same year they were married, according to that obituary. Why? The next question I had to ask. So Cavan was hit hard by the Great Famine between 1845 and 1849. And in 1847, the year before they got married and left, the potato famine was at its worst. That winter of 1847, there were a high number of people dying of starvation, cholera, smallpox, and typhus. The poor laws, which is how the Irish government penalized or was paying for the workhouses. It was through that taxation. Remember, I talked about Griffith's valuation for taxes. They were assessing those people who owned the land a high local tax based on the number of people that were going to work out, more people sick, more people losing their houses and place to go, into the workhouses they went. So the landlords were paying a huge tax. What some of the landlords do, especially in County Cabin, they paid the tenants the least. So, so I'm trying to put the things together here. And one of the most famous evictions from County Cabin was this Lao Shivan eviction, which occurred after these relatives left. But nevertheless, you understand the political, social, and economic situation. In November 3rd, 1848, 700 tenants were evicted by one landlord out of Ireland, uh, which was close to enough where these relatives were, were married. So things were tough. In fact, there's a song by Love, Love Was She Was Inside, uh, Irish ballad that talks about this has been seminar people being evicted. So I kind of have a historical context of why these relatives came to the United States. So I find them. They left Liverpool on the ship Swan in October 1848, and we are soon got there in November of 1848. I don't know how they got there, but it's 120 miles from Cavan to Dublin, which is the most likely port. And then from uh, Dublin, they would have gone to Liverpool, Liverpool, United States. Did some research, 1848, Liverpool to London, it was about three, about $4 in today's value. And it's cramped, it was terrible conditions to pitch them over. Landlords often paid the cost of shipping, but if you died in route, the ship's captain didn't get any money. So he wasn't, you know, he wanted to make sure your live people arrived. Um, they died in route, the captain didn't get uh, compensated. And they recorded when they came in in 1848, the age, age occupation of the people, where they're going to the United States. Now I'm going back to the immigration records we're talking about. This is the immigration record. They're arriving. Told me that they arrived on a particular ship on the Swan. It's hard to read, but here, James Colley, 25, is a seedsman. In other words, he was selling seed. That was his occupation in Ireland. He came from Cavan. He already knew he was headed for Rome, New York. Margaret was 20. She was a laborer doing the same thing. So now I've traced. Here they come. So the only thing I've got the dates and the birthdays of where they're going. But I did find in 1850 that James and Margaret had a daughter, Margaret, so one of those relatives of my wife's, and they were born in Constantine, Toledo County, New York. And I want to know why they went from Rome to there in 1850, <coughs> one year. But apparently there was a lot of um, 
shipbuilding and other things along this lake that was part of the transit route to further things west. So we might have gotten a job just as a laborer on a dock. Also, the construction of the Erie Canal began in 1817. That's close by, so there was obviously a transportation mode that may have provided us some labor. So, not to belabor, went through all of these data elements I can talk about when you're looking at here in the United States, <clears throat> census records, things that happened, where they were, what they were doing, up to the point when James died and Margaret died. So, pulling that stuff together gives me the opportunity to see where they went. So, now I've got them arriving in 1848, 1848, 1855, we're in upstate New York. Somehow they end up in Iowa, 1855, 1870. Again, one of the daughters uh, born there. 1870, 82, they're up here in uh, South Florida, area of Dubuque, Iowa. And then finally, 1882, 1921, they were in Omeo, Nebraska. So, tracing them across country, validating the stuff that was in that um, obituary. Why Omeo? <laughs> So, this US historical time. Well, Neil Nebraska was founded by a guy, General, as they called him, he really wasn't a general, who was a native of Ireland and a veteran of the American Civil War. And it was an honorary rank because he commanded three Finian brigade incursions into Canada. And I'll explain that later. He also, in 1875, <coughs> promoted a pamphlet called Northern Nebraska as a home for immigrants. And he wanted to establish an enclave of Irish immigrants in Nebraska, in what subsequently became O'Neill, Nebraska. This was not uncommon in this period of time because uh, the push pull migration of the Irish to the United States, the Irish felt more comfortable living among their own. You know, it's kind of a fact of life. There wasn't a lot of integration with other. Um, nationalities. And so these enclaves were very common as they stood up. And the property in and around Norfolk or, or uh, O'Neill was a great place to go. So I had to do some research of what were the Finians. So the Finians were known as the Irish Republican Brotherhood. That's why I say history is all important to them. They're a political society and wanted an independent Irish Republic. And so what they did is they planned on were raised into Canada, primarily between Brunswick and Ontario, to hold the areas hostage so the British government would you know, say finally, okay, we'll give up the space. You can have an independent Republic of Ireland, give us back to Canada. So the raids never occurred because they couldn't get the local support. And two weeks ago, I was up in, um, in, Brun in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, and I climbed this hill. This was a fortress that was built in 1812 by the British. In the War of 1812 against the United States. It provided a, what I call here now a defensive overlook of the Bay of Fundy. St. John's River flows into the Bay of Fundy, and actually down to the Atlantic Ocean. So, this is the view from up on top of this thing. I, I have to climb up the hill. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the secure fortifications here and some other, and the fact that there was no local support into St. John that the invasion plan for 1867 by General O'Neill failed or didn't trench fire. So, knowing where they are, knowing where they got there, taking my handy dandy bucket of water and soft bristle brush, my wife and I took the trek up to Nebraska. We found their headstone, and after I cleaned up a bunch of the stuff that was on it, I was able to read Margaret's headstone at 1825 James Reeves died. So 1890 gave me his age, it's 80 years, nine months, two days. So more details from the test. So what did I learn? Well, I was able to locate the Irish marriage and immigration records, confirming the dates that she said of 1848. The census records in New York in 1850 and 1855, I was able to confirm the residency. I found additional census records in the commission from Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska. In those census records, I was able to find that James was a gardener, a day laborer, a farmer, a hotel proprietor, which is all kind of consistent with what we did earlier. 
His naturalization records show that he established residency in the United States in 1884 in Nebraska and applied for naturalization at that time. And following James' death, she moved out her life with one of her sons and a daughter's house. So this was James, and this is his wife. And I'm going to include my wife's mother's old files. I found this photo, which has Margaret born in the cabin, tiny cabin. And this is uh, my wife's two times great grandmother. Um, I believe, based on the photo analysis I've done, this is between 1910 and 1915. So there's the camera. And then everybody smiles. <laughs> so, what are my next steps? Good genealogists will always get out of the rabbit hole, find more stuff. So, James Headstone said he died and gave me his exact number of years, months, and days. That means he was possibly born March 14, 1820. So, I'm going to go back and take a look. I've had time because it's difficult to go through these unindexed files. Look at the parish records of the county cabinet and the surrounding counties to see if I could find his baptism records. Family records show that Margaret was born on March 17, 1828. So again, I need to go back and take a look at those baptism records at the National Library of Ireland for her baptism. And as I said, one of my primary interests is one of the 11 children, but there may be other information from the other children of Margaret and James in their obituaries, which could give me more insights into what their life was like. And recently, I just discovered index trick records for a St. Peter's Church in the United County book, in which James and Margaret are listed as a parent to one child, and they have baptismal witnesses for other children who may be neighbors and friends, which then says maybe that's part of the poll on why they end up in Oneida County, New York, along with their close family here. Something else will look at. And in the 1850 census, James and Margaret reported with Patrick and Margaret McDonald. Now, well, okay, two years after they got the United States, why? There's got to be some relationship between them, and I need to assess that to see what the Irish connection is to. So, now you've seen how I've taken available Irish and U.S. records, pieced it together, using what I did know, validating the obituary information to tell a family story, how they went from the county capital to Nebraska. Thank you. Yeah. Somehow, are the Macaulay's and the McDonald's related? Don't know. That's one of the things I got in there. So, that's one of the, as uh, Linda Shaw Mills talked about, friends, acquaintances, and neighbors. Mm -hmm. So, you start to evaluate who you look at and everything associated with a cluster of people to see if you can figure out more about it. But at least I feel in this case, and you know, hopefully, I'm part of the idea that. This is how you fill out a family story. It's more than just birth, marriage, death, like that. You kind of tell the rationale behind why they immigrated and what the game in it once they got it. So hopefully this is helpful. And Margaret will born on St. Patrick's Day. So, yes. I, I really appreciate how you walked us through making sure that the bones of the story is accurate and correct and verified right. before you flush out all of those local stories. Right. The stories are wonderful, but they can be rabbit trails and you can follow them, but you can use the actual accuracy. And that's why I say there's possibly a grain of truth in every family lore that you've heard, mm -hmm. but you've got I would go back and validate it, not just validate it once. In the case of looking for the marriage records, I went to three different sources to try to make sure I had what I thought I needed as a key, which allowed me to impart off the other things I did. Right. And that's why, certainly, with um, genealogical resources that are available online, um, where you may take you back off of someone else's research. Right. Um, you have to be very careful and verify again and again because anybody anywhere can take a wrong turn yep. following one. Of them. I've often said the ancestry shape you leave is doesn't shape. Take it all to rain of God. When did the U.S. start um, requiring persons to become naturalized or did it? There was no requirement. There was no requirement. No. People did it to assimilate. To be able to vote, 
to do things like that. There's no requirement to do that. In fact, um, there's a whole train of study on citizenship and naturalization to include um, things like if you were married to a foreign born citizen, you're American and born to, uh, married to a foreign born citizen, you're World War II or World War I, you lost your US citizenship. Yes, my grandmother lost hers. So there's a whole bunch of things that go on there, but there was no requirement. Most often, uh, if they were at Civil War age at the time of the US Civil War, they were imparted citizenship as a result of fighting in the US Civil War. It was just a matter of applying for it. Uh, if you came in in the 1880s, 1890s, you had to go through the process of the local courthouse if you wanted to be able to vote. It's still on property, you still do anything like that. You know, if you want to be a fully fledged American, a lot of people went through that process. So if you came in the 1751 or two, there was nothing like, there. There was nothing. I mean, they, nothing did, there. they just came in yeah. and assimilated the best yes. they could in the That's right. That's right. And uh, came from a landed property owner based on the uh, property laws in the state that you were residing in as a landed property owner in the lower. So explain that to me. If my grandparents never naturalized, and then they had children. Were children, those children American? Children, children, children American. Because they were born in the country, even though their parents were not. And if the husband naturalized, that was good enough for the wife and the children. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you verify something for me? I was reading in a personal letter that um, some of my ancestors had to stay for five years in one location when they were naturalizing, is that true? You had to establish a, no, uh, I'll something like that. There's a little bit on that. Once you, you have to have established yourself in the United States for a period of for that, uh, the application for naturalization, application for naturalization. Once you did that, you had three to five years in which to prove that you're a good citizen. They did not have to stay in the same area. Okay. So your documentation, again, Keep in mind, everything started to uh, early 1900s when uh, what's now called U.S. Uh, Customs and Immigration Services, it's the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service, part of that. Before they took it over, everything's done on a courthouse level. So you'd exchange letters between courts, courts, whether it was between counties within the state or cross state boundaries. And something in this letter made me think that they had to stay planted for five years. Yeah, you have to be able to prove, though, it was much like the Homestead Act was, yeah. where you had people saying, yep, John Brown had a great farm, he put a granary in, he dug a well. You have to have something like that to validate that you are a good person and it's not a total refute in order to become a U.S. citizen. That's part of why it's probably going to be. And it was a personal letter, it wasn't right. anything firm. Did you have to be a U.S. citizen to get a homestead grant? Uh, yes. Okay. So you were in a citizen's packet, so you had to prove yourself. You could be an immigrant from across the United States with 160 acres, as long as you prove who you were. So, you get the, so the answer is no, you didn't have to be a citizen to apply for it, which is why the pamphleteers, I talked about that here on the L, send those pamphlets out. On in, there's room for everybody. So then, <laughs> any other questions? In fact, I was just in Alaska last year, and I did not know that Franklin Roosevelt, in his first term, had homesteads in Alaska. Hmm. That's a quick question, and I came in late, so maybe you covered this website online to get a replica copy of land grants. Um, what I would recommend you do is go to the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, a general land office, and you can search by last name, um, by state, and county if you know where the property was. And it will give you a um, picture of the patent that's in, used to be. I moved here three years ago, Virginia. Uh, down in Springfield, in south of where I live, there used to be a BLM office that had these massive ledgers. And in those ledgers, you would find these patents that you can make copies of. Those have all been digitized now and are available through the BLM GLO website. 
BLM with the Bureau of Land Management General Land Office. Thank you. And if you really are into it, uh, you know the uh, section range township number. You can request uh, through the National Archives. The uh, archives is open now. Um, I haven't been out there for about six months, but uh, you can request for about $75, I want to say, the entire land homestead back, which gives you the homestead application and that gives you the proof uh, that the homestead is a patent. And you get out a uh, distance set to me. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Hopefully, this helps. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Excellent. Now I'm more overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try to make it easy. <laughs>